Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. Survival was the rule of the day. My jaw was broken. I could feel my molars in the centre of the mouth. We're in a tight country. We're out there. At the end of the day, everyone is their job. We're in green as a soldier. Kidding yourself, blowing up does some interesting things to you. Uh, a place like the Middle East is constantly changing. What we do there is constantly changing. Constant change. 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 And this, the thing was our own minefield. He hauled me up with a broken whiskey bottle and machete. Welcome to another bonus episode of Life on the Line. When we were beginning work on this podcast, one of the veterans we reached out to was Rex Ward. Rex was the history teacher of my colleague Angus Horden. We wanted to interview Rex about his wartime service in Vietnam, but sadly Rex had suffered a stroke in December 2016. He's okay, but one of the things affected was his speech and he was not up to a full interview. We'll get to Rex's wartime service in more detail, but before we do, I spoke with Angus about his memories of Rex at school. So Angus, share with me some of your memories of Rex at school. Yeah, sure, Alex. I um, was at Knox in the 1970s and Rex Ward was my history teacher. I remember a lot about Rex. Before I go into history, I certainly remember him on the rugby paddocks. He always used to coach the top A team. Um, I was never in the A team, so I can always remember him on the field with the top teams. And he'd always wear his very distinctive army beret whenever he was on the field. He was a a great history teacher. Uh, He was the history master. I remember doing history with him and I can still vividly remember him explaining the horse-drawn artillery units of the Germans marching into the Sudetenland and the other parts of Europe early in the war and explaining how history had come with um, World War II with Hitler. He was a very inspirational teacher and a very compassionate man. I remember that we would used to spend a lot of extra time behind the scenes with him in his office going over history um, and studying all world events, which, which he always had just so much time for anyone who was interested in that. He was also a very compassionate man. I remember he had these pigeons that were just outside the classroom and all the boys used to open up the window in order to scare these pigeons away and he used to protect these pigeons like his own kids. I suppose in hindsight now having seen combat and war, he was probably quite happy to see life prosper. He told us in class that when he was in Vietnam, he had moved from a combat role into an education role, um, which was very admirable of him. And the Australian Army insisted that he carry his M16 with him everywhere, but he explained how that really scared all the Vietnamese children that he was teaching. So he traded his rifle for a pistol, Um, And consequently, he used to go around and teach with his pistol in his bag behind the desk, literally. So he was quite unarmed and and quite vulnerable, in fact, being a a sole teacher in a Vietnamese school uh, or village. And and really, if anyone wanted to do him in, they could have. But I think they all realised that he was doing good for them. When you were at school, Vietnam was at the height of its controversy after the war. How did having a teacher who was a veteran influence your perception of that conflict? So I finished school in 1980, so I was at Knox in the 70s. And and consequently, the Vietnam blowback didn't actually hit me as a, as a student as much as it would have hit my parents, who were all, as my father, being a Navy veteran of World War II. So... I wasn't as aware of the dishonour that was done to our troops that were were returning from Vietnam. I do know that Rex kept a very low profile of the fact that he was a Vietnam veteran and uh, never publicised it, never sought glory, um, just was very humble about uh, having served his nation with, with great pride. So when he was wearing the beret on the rugby field, that was just a subtle nod? Yes, I, I, I'd say it was... Um, him probably just sort of keep him warm um, because sometimes <laughs> it can be cold. Um, but also it, it, he was a very classy, handsome sort of guy and he looked quite debonair in his beret and, you know, most Australians would be wearing a American baseball cap or a giggle hat or something else other than a beret. So 
Rex was always quite distinctive. Um, he was well-dressed, well-spoken, always a commanding person on the field, uh, despite the fact he wasn't, you know, six foot tall sort of thing. And you've kept a lovely friendship going with Rex, your old teacher, to this day. Yes, look, I'm uh, fortunate to uh, be in touch with Rex. The wonderful experiences I had at school were really a uh, result of the excellent teachers that we had. I had wonderful, wonderful teachers um, in English, history in particular. Rex taught me so much about history and life, and I realised for him it was more than just teaching. He... Uh, sort of had a passion in wanting to instil and inspire his students in, in, in whatever means he could. And look, I, I well suspect this is something that, and it's been seen before, that if someone's gone out and they've suffered combat and they've suffered terror, that they want to try and put the negative things away, then, then focus on good things. Robert E. Lee, for example, after the American Civil War, put down fighting and became a a teacher, and I see that in Rex, how he just wanted to, you know, bring up the next generations in an informed and educated way, and and produce the best possible, you know, boys as it was in our case at school that he could, and he would do that in the classroom, and he would do that on the field because he was a big believer um, that rugby is a great educator. Um, and consequently, he used to be very inspiring in the way he would um, coach his boys uh, on the field as well. On another occasion, Angus was speaking with David Leaf. David saw service in Vietnam and is an old schoolmate of Rex. David recounted for us an occasion he ran into Rex in Vietnam. One time, David, you're on recreational leave in Vang Tau and you run into an old schoolmate. Can you recount the experience for me? Oh, most definitely. Yeah, very, very, very pleasant experience. There was a bar down in the recreation hut down in Vang Tau and I was just ordered some drinks and, um, and then was just waiting for them to be served to me and I was just looking around and I looked around and, and there, as I moved to one, looked to one side and there was Rex Ward. And Rex Ford was, uh, I mean, the, the, just to see ourselves, we just smiled and, and, and realised how nice it was to see each other because Rex was, um, in my year at school, he was a, a, a lovely character. He was uh, captain of the school. He was um, in the top teams of rugby and cricket, a great sportsman. And he was also the captain of the school at the time. And Rex was always positive. He was always supportive of everyone and always spoke very generously of everyone. And you knew when you met Rex, he always, he always thought well of you. He wouldn't think a negative thought about you. And immediately he was down to Vung Tau and I was coming back from, um, from Nui Dat for a few days. Just to talk with him and be with him was so nice. It was hard to make a really good friend and have a good soul-searching conversation with the people you were sharing in Nui Dat. There just, just wasn't the opportunity. It was a different feeling altogether in Nui Dat where the battalions were. They, they were near the front line, the battalions. It was so nice to see, see Rex and experience his generosity and his good nature. It, it was so lovely. Did you ever talk about Vietnam when you got together again? Amazingly, not much. It was interesting. Again, the same old story. We never spoke much about Vietnam. I actually, to this day, don't know much about his experiences. Even though we always love to see each other at the old boys' reunions, we don't really know about each other's experiences. So it's very much this Vietnam syndrome that because when you came back, the terrible reception that all the veterans received and how you guys literally kept it to yourself all your experiences that it became second nature that you just continued keeping I, everything I, to yourself i think that's right i actually think that's right it's funny you just sort of feel that no one is really interested strange if you had to summarize rex in a few words what would you say of him very generous very kind just uh, always thinking well of people and motivating him and always looking for the best in people.
We then invited Rex to Angus's home to read a short statement about his wartime service. It was 1967 when I first did my two years service in the army. We trained for three months in Kapuka outside Wagga Wagga. I was sent then to North Head as part of the artillery to undertake an advanced radio course. It was really an army's excuse for me to play rugby. I re represented the army and uh, Australian combined services. I felt I had missed the boat to go to Vietnam as my unit had already been deployed. I wrote to the commanding officer pleading my case and I wished to join my unit. The next thing I knew I was training in the jungle in Queensland for an extremely hard three weeks. I arrived in uh, Vietnam two weeks before Tet, the anniversary of the Vietnamese New Year. I was a replacement for another sh soldier. I was given an M M16 ammunition and provisions to last two weeks and was sent into the jungle from Nui Dat. My job as a radio operator for the battles of Coral and Balmoral. My unit was sent home and I was faced with spending more than six months um, in Vietnam. I applied for civil affairs, which was an agricultural, building, medical and education unit. It was a small unit to win the hearts and minds of the people which failed miserably in the long term. I was seconded to education with an officer. I taught in the Catholic school and in the state school in the afternoon. My first day was a, a culture shock, but a fascinating one. I walked into the first period with my M16 and placed it carefully in the corner. The army were insistent that we had our rifles in our possession at all times. This meant with you in the toilet, shower and at meals, and of course in operations it remained a part of you. It was a serious breach of discipline to be without the rifle. What I didn't appreciate was the response of the kids, especially the girls, who gave out a a little squeal. I quickly left the class and placed my rifle in the staff room and returned to the kids. Thank God it wasn't stolen. Whilst no doubt having a rifle in class may have been a good for discipline, it was absolutely inappropriate. So I got permission to take a, a nine millimeter revolver with me each day, to smuggled in an old leather case or briefcase which I bought from the local market. It was good to be a novelty. But I made a dreadful mistake. One boy spoke out of turn and I showed my slight displeasure. Mr. Hui was furious with the boy and brought him out to the front and whacked him with the cane. The boy remained on his knees on the front of the classroom under my nose, presumably seeking forgiveness. I wanted to hug the little bloke and ask him for forgiveness. I never raised my voice again. The school days began at 7.30am and we finished for lunch around noon. Then we would share lunch in the staff room before having a nap on bamboo mats on the floor. The cook was a wooden old lady from North Vietnam who lived at the back of the school. She was a great cook, often offered uh, as some North Vietnamese specialty, including dog, snake and semi-congealed duck's blood, which I politely 
shared in tiny amounts. I got to know one of the Vietnamese teachers particularly well, and it was 30 years before I went back to Vietnam to find him. I was discharged at the end of 68. After reading the statement, Angus and Rex went through some old school memorabilia of Angus's. One of the things they found was Angus's school report. Thanks Rex for coming over and sharing your story on Vietnam today. And in your hands is a copy of my old school report. And of course, being my history master at Knox, it's got a little notation from you. Yes, it. Uh... I noticed that you've scored 83 um, with an A and 1. I mentioned that uh, your tolerance and love of history. Uh, I've said top history enthusiast and working so hard tends to miss the point of the question which is dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) So, Rex, thank you again for coming and sharing your stories and spending all those hours in the classroom with us. It really meant a lot to me. Thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. That was our conversation with Rex Ward. We were so glad Rex was able to come and speak with us. Rex's stroke hit home, especially for Angus, and it epitomises the reason why we're doing this podcast. If we don't capture these stories now, they'll be lost forever. If you like the episode, you can let us know by writing to us at podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com and we're known across social media as Life on the Line Podcast. And if you know a veteran serviceman or service woman with a story to tell, please get in touch. We'd love to have them on the podcast and the importance of capturing these stories while we can cannot be understated. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget.